I'm really excited to be with you guys today. Um, the title of my talk, The End of History, it's kind of a really nerdy wordplay. So the first part has to do with like kind of moving past the cap theorem, which is something that kind of happened a while ago, very quietly, and maybe behind closed doors in big data uh, centers and tech companies. And it's a revolution that's going to spread just as the modern data stack has spread. So I'm going to be talking about that in my talk, and then the kind of double entendre pieces that um, we, we don't have to just query ancient history as we do in a batch world. We can now, it's going to get much easier to query real-time data plus old history, hence the end of history. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story about my past week. Um, so on the 24th, I was in Switzerland, in Verbier, um, giving a talk about data modeling in real time at uh, the Leading Edge IT conference. Uh, it's called Skiers and Data. It's a fantastic conference, but I highly recommend against doing <laughs> two conferences, Europe and the US, four days apart. So that was the 24th. This is the 28th. I actually don't know what day it is. I got, in, I got to sleep last night at 3 a.m., but we're going to have a lot of fun today, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, another aspect of this trip besides the sleep deprivation and the jet lag, is some various experiences with uh, airlines. And uh, either I have really bad air travel karma, or I was blessed with an opportunity to talk about real-time data in a very practical context. So I'll get back, th back to that in a second. But anyway, if I say anything insightful, that's definitely my own brilliance. If I say anything stupid, that's definitely sleep deprivation and jet lag. So <laughs> um, I'll ask for your forbearance in that respect. OK, so when I was flying to, uh, to Geneva to go to Verbier, the airlines lost my bag. Major International Airline lost my bag. And then a day before I flew out, my bag arrived at my hotel, kind of got all cleaned up, got fresh clothes on, and then I flew back to uh, JFK. And they, they, another international airline that's a partner of the first airline lost my bag again. And so <laughs> this is an opportunity to see um, what impact real-time data can have in businesses today. Uh, specifically, at about 1.30 a.m., as I was at JFK talking to the baggage agent for this airline about where my bag was, she, said, she was looking this up in a system, and she said, well, I see one event here, and there should be two events. So the event that shows up is that my bag arrived in Amsterdam, supposed to go back to JFK, and so it got scanned and authorized to go back to the U.S., and then there's supposed to be a second event that says, hey, this bag has been loaded into a container, and then it's going to go on the 777, and it's going to fly back to the US. But the second event was not there. So it looked like the bag just somehow didn't make the plane, maybe because it was a close connection. Now, this had me dreaming about what we could do with real-time technology. In a real-time world, using streaming analytics, we could do things like when the plane takes off, there's an event, and then you check for events for various bags. You just say, here's an event that authorizes this bag to get on the plane, and we're missing a second event that is supposed to load the bag on the plane. And then as I log on to the Wi-Fi on the plane, I get a message that says, hey, we apologize. It looks like your bag didn't make it onto this plane. And then I can start a chat to arrange what happens with my bag at that point. And in particular, I could arrange that I'm going to JFK, but I'm going on to Austin, and so let's make sure that the bag gets forwarded to Austin. And with this kind of technology, with this kind of data technology, everyone is a lot happier. The airline's happier because the situation gets resolved much more quickly. The customer's happier because they're not wondering where their bag is and standing at the baggage claim for an hour, waiting for it to show up, then trying to find the baggage office, waiting in line, talking to someone who then has to figure out what's going on. Um, it's fashionable, it has been fashionable for some time to talk about being data-driven in business. But the reality is that virtually every business now is data-driven. What does it mean to be data-driven? Well, we saw with the situation at Southwest Airlines that every system, every flight, every, every employee, every action of many of these businesses is tied to data. There's a database that determines where airline personnel go. There are databases that determine when flights take off and when bags get delivered and when they get loaded on planes. And if there's a failure anywhere in that chain, it will bring down the entire business and cause it to grind to a halt. And so I think it's time to talk more about, not about data being data-driven, but about data performance. Again, every business is data-driven. Data performance is about doing better things with data, like making your data more real-time, more accessible, better serving your customer needs, getting more insights, 
And of course, from a business perspective, obviously making more money. That's what businesses try to do. But when they make more money, ideally, their employees have more opportunities, their shareholders have more opportunities. There are many, many good things in principle that can come from being more data performant. And in particular, I'm going to talk about real-time technology and how the we've seen a lot of movement in real time in the last decade, but it's kind of stalled at the same time. And yet, from my perspective, there's a quiet revolution happening that hasn't spread into the culture of tech quite yet, but will in the next few years. And it will be a massive augmentation to the modern data stack and the impact it's had on businesses. Okay, um, who am I? I'm Matt Housley. So I have a PhD in mathematics, actually, and I taught for about a decade between grad school, postdoc, and just my career before moving into the data space. Um, I worked in the data space for a number of years and then switched over to running a consulting company, which I co-founded with Joe Reese called Ternary Data. And so, frankly, we used to do a lot of services work. We kind of shifted more into the advising space, technology advising, training, advising investors, advising small and large companies about where to go with technology to be successful. And I'm also a co-author, oops, sorry, I have two, there we go. I'm also so a co-author of this book with Joe Reese, um, Fundamentals of Data Engineering. And so in this book, we try to focus both on the technology and the process act, aspect of data. How does data engineering really impact a business and how should you think about data engineering processes? And so this talk today builds on those basic ideas. Um, I would love to talk to you about it, uh, about things you agree with, things you object to, and so track me down later at this conference if you have ideas about the book, or talk to me some other time if we don't get to connect here. All right, when I talk about the end, end of history, one of the things I'm talking about is the CAP theorem. Can someone tell me what the C, A, and P stand for in the CAP theorem? Yes, consistency, availability, partition, tolerance. Okay, what does this mean in practice? Let's talk about the practical aspects of the CAP theorem. Um, fundamentally, consistency, well, okay, let, let me back up just a second here. Um, really, this is, they, they, the original theorem is more about uh, distributed data store. And I actually agree with Jordan Tagani that big data, as we knew it, is dead. But we still need distributed data stores. Like, they're still really fundamental for businesses. Uh, so these are problems we have to talk about. And so with a distributed data store, you have to worry about problems of consistency. And so the idea of consistency is that when I make a read on that distributed data store, whatever I see the latest updates, whatever has been written, I will see in a response to my query, or I'll get an error. The database might just tell me that it can't respond at that time to a particular query, but it'll be one of the two. I'm not gonna get inconsistent data if my database is fully consistent. Availability means that I'll always get a response. Um, it might be an incorrect response if my database doesn't satisfy the first bullet point. It might be, but I will never get an error. I'll always, always get some kind of response to my query. Partition tolerance has to do with a distributed system. Anytime you have a distributed system, you're going to get partitions, meaning nodes can't communicate, traffic gets lost. This happens even inside your own data center. You can't guarantee that your network is gonna work correctly 100% of the time. You're gonna have problems in any distributed system where there's a lack of communication. And so partition tolerance basically on some level means that your beta database behaves correctly when there's a lack of communication. It's not just gonna fall over. Um, there, there are more technical details here, obviously, but the big idea of the CAP theorem is that you can't have all three of these. You can't get all of these in one. Um, obviously, we could go on and debate about Google Cloud Spanner, for example, and if it's a counterexample to the CAP theorem, and people say, well, not really for various reasons, but we're not gonna get too far into that because mostly I care about an analytics application of this idea, and which is, I'm a math person, PhD is in math, and so I like corollaries. This is essentially a corollary to the CAP theorem. So in designing a database or distributed data store, we can choose one of the following. So I can either have an ACID database with high rate asynchronous updates, and so think of Postgres in a typical mode, backing an application, say a bank account application, which is a really common example, where I need absolute consistency, I need transactions, I need, I need to make sure that two people don't withdraw money from an account at the same time and overdraw it. These are the kinds of characteristics that an ACID database will give me, 
And typically, you can have like thousands of transactions per second. So you can have very, very quick updates. Um, in general, that will conflict with the second application, which is fast analytic scans. So in other words, the second bullet point is a database that's designed to scan, say, could be 100 gigabytes or a terabyte of data all at once, very quickly, and then return statistical or analytical results on that data. And so the second type of database is typically used in analytics or machine learning applications. Um, and so in general, you can't satisfy both of these things at the same time. Um, if you, I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, there was a company I worked for at one point, and in the past, in the old days, they had an ACID database that backed their website. And so someone during a presentation wanted to present some analytics from this database, and so they ran a SQL query, and the database basically, ground, or the website ground to a halt because they were locking all these rows, running a huge query on this database, and so nothing else could happen at the same time. And so in terms of the CAP theorem, the second type of database essentially relaxes, um, relaxes consistency. In other words, you tend to use, especially in the modern columnar version of an analytics database, you tend to use a snapshot model where you kind of see the latest snapshot, but you're not going to try to keep track of thousands of transactions per second anymore. And commonly, we deal with this by using a process called ETL. So we keep these two databases separate, and then we periodically, in batch, so going back to the batch versus real-time idea, in batch, we move data into the analytics database once in a while. Oops. I keep, okay. How do we beat the cap theorem? So you can't beat the house in Vegas, and you can't beat the cap theorem. But there are ways to kind of go around the cap theorem. Um, fundamentally, when we run into a really hard problem, often the solution to that problem is to rethink the assumptions, to drop an assumption somehow. So for example, uh, Albert Einstein, special relativity. People think that his contribution to was, was to come up with the Lorentz transformations, all these ideas about how time and space transform if you're in different frames. But actually, his big contribution was to drop the idea of an ether, of a privileged frame, to say, wait, we don't really need this. Let's get rid of it and see what happens. That's fundamentally what he did. And so with the cap theorem, we can get around the cap theorem by dropping a big assumption. And actually, this is from a post. Uh, it's actually a blog post that introduces a fundamental architectural idea by Nathan Mars. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I highly recommend that you read it. Um, but he says, this post is going to challenge your basic assumption on how data systems should be built. And so he introduces something called the Lambda architecture, which we're going to talk about today. At this point, that version of the Lambda architecture is kind of outmoded. It's complicated. It's hard to query. It's hard to manage. But we're going to talk about how that's evolved into something new that's more accessible. And the assumption he drops We've already talked about having multiple databases. We have our transactional database, and we have our analytics database, and there's a transfer between them in batch. But his assumption is instead, let's have multiple databases that operate semi in real time. And so the basic architecture looks like this for a Lambda architecture. Um, you have your data source and messaging queue. And then instead of in batch just moving data into a bulk system, you actually still do that, but then you introduce another database that's more real-time, um, that's more of a streaming system. Now, the problem is the streaming system will have some limitations for querying massive amounts of data at once. It's going to struggle with that use case in some cases. And so instead, you have two pieces. You can run large batch queries in your batch portion, and you can run small, what I'll call near real-time queries in your streaming portion, and then you can combine the results. And so, for example, Suppose my batch portion gets updated once a day with a ton of data pulled out of this messaging queue. And then the real-time portion, maybe I'll query for the last six hours since the last update happened to the large system. And then I can get a picture of analytics across, say, the last six weeks all at once. I can run two queries, combine the results, and get a nice result that's near real-time. Um, the problem with this approach is that it's complicated. So, Back when this came out, if you handed it to your data science team, they now had to deal with querying two systems. Plus, um, I'm going to talk about an abstraction idea here. There, there are many ways to frame abstractions in technology. This is just kind of one heuristic for doing this. Over time, we've moved up and up in the abstraction layers. Uh, but also, our architectures have gotten much, much more complicated. So you start down at the hardware level. That's like your CPUs. Back in the 
1980s, a long time ago when I was a kid, I used to do assembly language programming on a Commodore 64. That's the kind of thing we used to do back then. But a lot of the reason that programming and software have advanced is that we moved up this chain of complexity and we've automated a lot of the lower levels of abstraction. The problem with the Lambda architecture as it was realized is that people were still trying to manage a lot of these pieces. All the way, maybe not to the hardware level anymore, but there was a tendency at the time to still operate at the operating system level. So install software and a bunch of nodes. And then at the next level, software frameworks. Okay, I'm going to install Hadoop, and I'm going to install Kafka on these nodes. And then I have the cluster level. Cluster level is things like, in Hadoop, I have to worry about Hadoop nodes and Zookeeper nodes. It turns out there are multiple clusters I have to maintain within a Hadoop cluster. Similar case with Kafka. I have to maintain all that stuff. Then the system level. The system is Kafka itself, so all the pieces that make up Kafka, and then all the pieces that make up Hadoop. And then on the last level with architecture, we can debate. There, there's a lot of debate about what exactly architecture is. In this case, I'm using it to mean multiple systems. So in other words, I'm using it to mean this big picture here, where I'm maintaining multiple systems. I have to keep them all going. I have to make the different pieces interact correctly, behave, and ideally not fall over at some point, maybe in the middle of the night for a very business critical process, which the more, the better this technology becomes, the more mission critical it becomes, the more important it is that it doesn't fall over. Okay, so that was a key problem with the Lambda architecture. There was the query complexity and there's the maintenance complexity. Now I'm going to show you, well, actually I wanna talk a bit more about this. Um, I think in general in tech right now, we have a complexity problem. And the complexity problem is that we are in tech companies and enterprises maintaining very complex infrastructure. And this comes at a high human cost. Um, so for example, recently for a client, I was working on setting up a data hub, which is a data catalog system. And so I set out a template and I deployed managed services. I got everything set up to do this for the client. I did it in my own environment. And then I tried to deploy in their environment too. And it turned out that between the time I started and the time I tried to deploy, there was an update to Amazon EKS and they had deprecated the version of Kubernetes we were using and so I couldn't deploy. That's the kind of stuff you have to deal with when you're working in these lower levels of abstraction. And that is, it's a lot of human labor to keep these kinds of things going. And so in order to focus more on data, I'll come back to this in a bit, but in order to focus more on actual data and applications, we have to kind of move away from some of this complexity. And with the modern data stack, this is what we've seen, right? We've started to hand off some of these details, moving from Hadoop to say a cloud distributed data platform where someone else is worrying about those things and I can just worry about the queries and the data. Maybe there are some low level things I have to do, but I can start handing off some of these lower levels. Now the problem in real time is that we haven't quite gotten there yet, but actually I'm gonna argue that we're pretty close and that the transformation that needs to happen next is more of a social and business transformation the technology is kind of there waiting to spread in our industry. And I'm also going to talk about how that transition could go very wrong if we don't handle it correctly. Okay, so I talked about the cost of complexity. Now I'm going to show you an even more complex architecture and I'm going to tell you how this is super complicated but also better for people using the system. So notice now, well, let me kind of explain what's happening here. So a lot of stuff going on here. Um, before I was feeding my system with one application database and the data went to two paths. And so this is a one path architecture and it also abstracts away the complexities of querying two systems. So my application database, you have change data capture running. Change data capture pulls the changes off of that database. In other words, as writes happen into that database, they get detected and passed into a queue and then those go into an event buffer. So the event buffer collects these events and that's my real-time part. And then I have a non-real-time part because the real-time part has scalability limitations. In other words, it might be running on RAM so it's really fast or SSD, but it will run out of space eventually. And so I need to have another batch part, which is on the right. That's that table commit part. So the table commit part is like a conventional analytics database. Think Hadoop or Snowflake or BigQuery. It's like handles large amounts of data and can scan very efficiently. And so the idea is that over time, I have an automated system that rolls up events out of the event buffer and then dumps them into the batch part and takes care of that detail for me. 
Now, of course, this is complicated, right? Because I assume that I've got engineers running all of this stuff. They have to think about all these moving parts and manage it. But at least for the user, these details are taken care of. OK, now what about the part where before I had to query two separate systems? Well, now I'm going to have a query orchestrator that takes care of that for me so that my data scientist or my analyst can just type a query. The query goes to the query orchestrator. The query orchestrator decides this is the data that's in the real-time part. This other data is in the batch part, runs two queries, combines the results, and returns them seamlessly. And so I just see output spit out. For the user, it's fantastic. For ops, it's a huge pain. Ops is not going to be happy about this because actually I have like, how many databases do I have running in this architecture? Secretly, I have like four different databases. So remember I said that to get around the cap theorem, the trick is instead of having one database, you have multiple databases that do different things and satisfy different constraints. So I have my application database. Secretly, I didn't put this in the diagram, but I have like an event stream buffer, something like Kafka. That's really another type of database or data store. I have an event buffer, and I have this batch piece over in the upper right-hand corner. So four different databases, a whole bunch of things to maintain. Okay. Um, does anyone know what this is? You've probably seen some cartoons like this before. What do we call these? It's a Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, so this thing I built is awesome, but it's starting to look like a Rube Goldberg machine. It's super, super complicated. Except that if we think about it, we've got a lot of Rube Goldberg machines working behind the scenes that work perfectly if we have an adequate level of automation and management in place. Um, so for example, the aircraft I flew, I flew back from Amsterdam to the United States on a Boeing 777 aircraft. Incredibly complicated machine, two engines, all kinds of systems, all kinds of computer automation to make sure that the aircraft flies correctly. Back in the 1960s, they actually had to have three people flying that aircraft. They had an engineer that would help manage the systems and then two pilots. And then in the late 1960s, they got rid of the engineer and were able to automate things enough, plus train the pilots to do more engineering so that you went down to two pilots. And in tech, we're still kind of in that phase where we need engineering, but we're maybe doing more engineering than we need to be doing in a typical company. And so by hiding the abstractions of the Rube Goldberg machine, we can have something that behaves seamlessly for application developers and analysts so they don't have to think about a lot of these details. OK, so I'm going to come back to this idea, the super complicated thing here. When we think about the modern data stack, what is the modern data stack? Well, it's really the, it's managed services. It's taking all this complexity that we used to have to manage ourselves in Hadoop and managing it for us so we can just think about our data. And now I'm going to tell you that this is actually something where I could set this up in an hour. It turns out I'm, not, I'm trying not to use the names of vendors too much today because I want to talk more about general terms and general trends and not about specific vendors. If you're curious, I can tell you more about where this comes from. But this is actually an architecture that a vendor offers more or less off the shelf, fully managed. Um, there are a couple of things that I would have to set up for you to do a demo. So I'd have to set up a managed application database some kind of SQL database like Postgres. I'd have to set up a managed queue, and then I'd be able to set up this other piece that would handle all the queries and the real time and the batch part and the roll up for me more or less automatically. And so this is, this is technology that's available today, but I think the cultural shift that embraces this version of real time hasn't really happened yet. And I, I compare it to what happened with the modern data stack. The modern data stack actually didn't happen overnight. I think the kickoff for the modern data stack was the release of Google BigQuery back in 2010. A long, long time ago, right? That was over a decade ago. And it took a while for people to notice that this technology was available. So until like 2016 or so, Hadoop was all the rage, like setting up your own big cluster, very complicated to manage, very complicated to run. That was what people were doing. And yet there was this other technology that could man automate a lot of those processes for you. In terms of the social part, it took a while just to get that message out there. So specifically, I remember looking at BigQuery in 2016. I was like reading their documentation. At the time, I was using an on-prem MPP data system for querying large amounts of data. And I was also using Hadoop in parallel. And I looked at the documentation. I couldn't really understand what BigQuery was for. I'm like, what, what is this system exactly? And these tools that allow us to combine batch in real time like this are already out there, but it's going to take a while for that to get socialized and for us to figure out data applications built around these tools. Um, 
Who has heard from a major, there's a major database vendor, again, I'm not naming names too specifically, that claims that they will have a database in the near future that does transactional and analytics all in one. Okay, you've probably heard these claims. Fundamentally, what is that? Well, I'm, I'm betting almost like 99% chance that it's something like this architecture, right? What they're doing behind the scenes is running something like this for you and then letting you just worry about your data, not having to worry about those details anymore of managing all these moving parts and components. Okay, so what does this let us do as analytics engineers, data engineers, application engineers? Well, we can start thinking of having these moving parts inside of a box where instead of having to manage all the moving parts, we can just connect to the box and build our data application. Now, I should be clear here, there are definitely companies that need to worry about all this complexity, right? If I'm operating at the scale of Google, this is, what, this is my business, this is what I do, I sell cloud services. If I'm operating at the scale of AWS, this is what I do, this is what I offer to customers. Um, but Google and Amazon have entire teams. Uh, Google has a huge team that works on just Google Colossus, which is just their storage system that backs a bunch of other products. And Amazon has a huge team that works on Amazon S3, which backs all kinds of other products. And so we're getting to the point where those abstractions are handled by large tech companies, but small startups and enterprises are just going to see something more like this. And so ultimately, it becomes more of a black box, although we need to kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes to make sure that we use the tool appropriately. Um, eventually, I think we're at the cusp of a point where we'll, we'll be able to think of this type of tool as a database, one database with two interfaces. And so what do I mean by that? Well, you still need, you need ACID, right? For your applications, you have to maintain consistent state. You have to be able to handle thousands of transactions per second. You simultaneously want to be able to run analytics on that application. And so let's think about the possibilities with this kind of architecture where you can dispense with the complexity of managing all these tools. Say I'm an airline, and right now, I look at taking my baggage management system and making it real time as an incredibly complicated proposition. I have to set up CDC into a target, maybe a Kafka stream. And from there, I need to add a stream processor of some kind. And each of these moving parts has a lot of management involved. And I'm an airline, I'm not a tech company. And so I have a really hard time recruiting the talent that can do these kinds of things. I have a hard time managing those teams. I'm not gonna be able to continue with Google in these kinds of operations. But once we get to the point where this becomes more of a black box where I can deploy something off the shelf with multiple interfaces, and so I can have on the one side a, a transactional interface that handles all the updates to my state as new events happen, as I get information about where bags are located, and on the other side I have an analytics interface where I can run SQL queries or run streaming queries and I can see what's going on with bags at scale. So I can run a query that queries everything that's happening with bags on that aircraft without overwhelming my transactional system. And so now suddenly I have a data application where I can provide a better experience for customers. And so customers now will see more in real time about what's happening with their bags, where if a flight takes off, it triggers an analytics job that says, let's look at the state of all these bags and let's find out what's going on with them. And if there's a problem, then I start sending out alerts and other systems. Um, and I, I guess at some point, here I'm, I'm taking a fairly simple picture of this. It turns out that with real time, you can think either in terms of batch queries or in terms of windowed queries, which I think are a more modern approach to the problem. So with batch queries, I'm still just running SQL. I'm doing things like querying all the data for the last six weeks, including the latest data that's just coming in. With windowed queries, I can do things like operational analytics, where I look at the last five minutes of a stream, and I collect statistics consistently on the last five minutes of a stream, and maybe I emit new results every couple seconds. And so with these new abstractions, my analytics engineers, my data engineers, my machine learning engineers can just focus on writing the jobs that do that stream processing or batch processing on real-time data without, again, worrying about the underlying details of the architecture. Now, what I'm gonna say here is this is not going to replace the modern data stack from my perspective. There are still a lot of things that just need to be batched and probably will be for the foreseeable future. And specifically what I've seen as a consultant and just working with various companies is that companies that have tried to dump all their data 
um, into real-time systems generally don't succeed. It's just, it's, as they call it, boiling the ocean, right? It's way too complicated, and it doesn't have a specific goal in mind. Uh, also, many data sources are not very suitable for real-time analytics. So think about, for example, third-party data that comes in, and you're only allowed to access it in a batch. It's a very common scenario, and I actually think for privacy reasons, that's going to become more and more the case. We've seen this in ad tech, right? Ad tech a few years ago was much more real-time. They're starting to cut back on real-time because real-time with that type of data can create very serious privacy issues, and as that becomes more of a concern, some data is just going to arrive in batch. But internally, within the companies that you work for, there are almost always opportunities to deploy real-time in a way that will move the needle on the business. And so that comes back to, for example, the airline example or another example that I saw was a company that uh, couldn't keep track of their inventory, and so they would often sell things they didn't have. So that's a great opportunity for real-time to augment that company's capabilities and better serve their customers. But I guess the, the summary here is that instead of focusing on making everything real-time, we should use the modern data stack for what it's meant for, so for really good analytics and reporting, and then identify opportunities to deploy real-time technologies as we identify business possibilities. Um, this is a Joe Reese coinage, actually, and it also appears in our book, and it's a notion called the live data stack. And the idea of the live data stack is that I start thinking of my application, so I build some kind of app, and I start thinking of it as a unified layer all the way from the application data to analytics. And there are quite a few applications where this is interesting. Right now, we think of those as being partitioned and separate. But what if I can think about them as being unified in certain cases? So one, one case that was interesting is we had a client that was um, handling a lot of resumes. And so they would do resume processing for large enterprises. And so quite often, the companies buying the SaaS service were interested in getting immediate, near, what I'll call near real-time analytics on the resumes that were coming in. And so they might be interested in seeing how many people have applied for this job in the last hour, for example. And they were really struggling to make this work. I think in the future, with some notion of a live data stack, when you build that application from the get-go, you'll build in some analytics assumptions for real-time data that you can query without causing the back-end database to topple over. Um, another really critical thing that we need to talk about is accountability and best practices. So it turns out that real-time data has, has kind of gotten a black eye if you followed technology over the, several, over the last several years because of issues with privacy. Um, anything that you can do that's bad with data can be much worse if it's done in real time, which means that as we deploy more real-time applications, we have to think very carefully about what we're doing with data and how we're protecting people's privacies and how data could be misused to make sure that it's not misused. So, for example, I'm aware of a company a few years back that was... Um, Basically, your phone has what's called a, it has a hardware network address, something called a MAC address. And the MAC address gets broadcast out as it's communicating with the cellular network. Now, if your phone has a unique MAC address, it's always the same, what does that allow? If I can listen into that MAC address, what could I do with that data? I can track people, right? So there was a company I was aware of that was doing exactly that. They figured out, okay, I can put listeners all over town. I can pick up on people's MAC addresses, and then I can track their location. Um, and this, of course, that has some very frightening privacy implications. So if you can track people, a good actor could use it to track bags moving through an airport. A bad actor can use this to stalk people, basically. So that becomes kind of terrifying. So what happened to this company is Apple figured out, and other cell phone vendors, that this was going on, and so they came up with a process called MAC address churning, where your MAC address randomly changes to make sure that people can't track you over time. Um, so basically, this company essentially shut down overnight. I mean, they kind of were a shell of what they were doing before. They reframed themselves as a traffic tracking company because they could track devices in the short term, but not in the long term. But basically, their business shut down. And that's because they weren't thinking about the privacy implications of the things they were doing and the terrifying aspects of this real-time technology. Um, whatever you do with real-time applications, you always need to think about data privacy, even in batch. But now it becomes much, much more critical. So going back to location tracking, location tracking in batch is frightening, right? If I can look at someone's location history, I can get an idea of what their movement patterns are. 
daily habits. That is dangerous data. But if I can do it in real time, then I can know their location at any time, which poses a threat to their physical safety. This is a, a critical responsibility for anyone who works with data. You're dealing with something that's a very powerful tool that can harm people. And so as you're working with this new generation of real-time applications, you have to make sure that things you're doing help your customers and don't potentially harm them. So like tracking their bags as they're in the airport, moving from plane to plane, going through connections can be very helpful to, your, their, to customers. Tracking bags as they're going home can pose a threat to their safety. Um, in addition, that, that's a key piece of accountability, right? Always keep track of what bad actions could happen as a consequence of the data you're collecting. In addition, we have to think about best practices for building systems and for controlling costs. So over the last year, we've seen a lot of debate and a lot of argument online over the modern data stack. Is the modern data stack dead? Does the modern data stack cost too much? And I would say that most of these debates come down to the fact that people are using a tool that they don't fully understand. So why are people's cloud bills exploding? Well, in many cases, they just have no notion of cost control and appropriately running jobs that aren't extremely expensive. Um, why are we having privacy issues with data? Well, off, in many cases, these tools are so easy to set up that people haven't had any privacy training before they're turned loose on a very powerful system that can run massive queries over data that might contain sensitive data. As we see deployment of more real-time technologies, we need to start training people before they're given access to these tools that make to make sure that they understand the business app implications of the tools they're using, and once again, the privacy implications that I was talking about before. And I'll stop there. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, this is my email address, my LinkedIn, and I also have a Twitter, at Dr. Housley, which is super pretentious. I'm trying to get into tweeting more, and uh, I, I'm excited to talk to you guys after the talk about this discussion.